Welcome to session four of On Being a Theologian of the Cross. Thank you for joining us. Remember to follow us on YouTube, uh, like us on Facebook, and also reach out and let us know your questions or your thoughts on this study. We're glad that you're with us. Let us begin our time together with a word of prayer. The Lord be with you. Loving God, we are celebrating being together today and being able to explore more of your grace for our lives. As we enter into the study, help us to grapple with the hard subjects, but help us also to grow in understanding your true love for us. Help us to better understand who you are so we can better understand who we are. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Question one um, in our section today. What do theses one through 12 deal with? What do they deal with? This is kind of a recap. We've gone through the first 12 theses in our study. So what, what are they really dealing with? How we get righteousness. How we get righteousness, and specifically, how we, we attain it, how we, how we um, earn it, merit it. Um, the, the idea, theology of glory has the idea that we have input, you know, in this. And that, so we're going to be dealing more with that as we deal with theses 13 through 18. Now we're going to be looking at Luther's response of what theology of the cross looks like. So what do Luther's theses 13 through 18 address? This is on page 49 and 50. It asks us, like, what do we bring when it comes to our glory about how we're being saved, about how the cross believes that we have some input, it may be small, but we have an input on our saving. On the cross, we do not. Yeah, the, the, the word, the line in here that I think is important is, the theological uh, problem arises out of the recognition and confession that we are saved by grace alone. Only grace, not our merit. It's that struggle of how do we get salvation you know, and the theology of the cross leans into very clearly, we don't do anything for it. It is what God does for us. But is it any way relating to us doing our best? The theology of glory has the concept of do your best, God will do the rest. That's the kind of theology of glory that you're having input. For theology of the cross, we do good things in response to what God has done for us. Not to earn anything. Not to do our best as though we're getting something. But rather doing it out of response, out of love, out of... Um, being filled with God's grace. Does that make sense, Carla? Okay, good. Number three, discuss the problem of the little bit. And here um, we have the writing, Luther's teachers were from the particular branch of the late medieval scholasticism, nominalism, that held that if we do what is in us, that is if we do our best, we can be assured that God will not fail to give us the desired grace. So we always come back to the question of the little bit, one of the telltale signs of the theology of glory. What's the problem with the little bit? The way I saw it, it's more like that you're expecting a reward for being how you're supposed to, yep. instead of being like, the entire point is to expose that we are helpless without, uh, the, without uh, being saved by the cross. Yes. By saying that we have a little bit, it's saying that oh, we, we, we expect a reward as if, you know, it's something to work towards as if we're not already. 
Yes. We're going to, we're going to deal with in a little bit um, some conversation about sin. And the issue is that we can address here with that is that little bit assumes that sin has not affected our whole being. You know, the original sin. What is the original sin? To be like God. God. Yeah. And then we see that played out in the early book, early chapters of Genesis. To assume then that any shred of our being is not affected by that then a little bit makes sense if, oh, well, yeah, I'm, I've, I'm part of original sin, but there's a little bit of me that, no, we're totally affected by original sin. We are left helpless. And it's when we recognize there is nothing that I can do, and it's all God, then we're seeing through the cross. Does that make sense? when we see that salvation does not hang upon us, no matter how good we might act, it's not going to get us there. In one parish, I had a gentleman that, um, he was a mean old cuss. He, um, his wife had died before I got there. The church had burned. Um, they didn't have insurance. And so he got salvation in his eyes. He paid $10,000. He was... He was wealthy in that community. He gave $10,000 to rebuild the church. And he therefore deserved to go to heaven. He didn't go to church. He was mean as a, as a hornet to his family and his neighbors. Um, he died while I was there. And he had ended up scratching out just about every member of his family from the will. He left the church in. We got his pickup truck. Um, but his idea was he was getting salvation on his own and he totally missed God's love for him. He totally missed what God was up to. We still like, in in little and big ways, we still like the little bit in, in theology, but it doesn't work. Let's go to number four. On page 51, Forty discusses the freedom of the will. How does this all relate to grace? And how do Luther's comments listed in paragraph 2 help us? Thoughts? When we see that the idea of our will, that we have freedom of the will, we have to understand that in the context of we're corrupted. We are still held captive by sin. We are still under the influence of sin. It is only by God's grace that we are freed, not by our doing. Even though we want to or think we can, we cannot will it. We cannot make it happen. The comments in the last paragraph, he says that if we are to use the term free will at all, we should limit it to our everyday freedom in those things that are below us. So if you were, um, if you were part of the study of where God meets man, talking about latter theology, this will sound familiar. Um, we have freedom in those things that are below us but not attempt to extend it to those things that are above us. Below us means the things that that are in our control, that we can affect. We have freedom of will. What do you want to wear today? Um, Carla wanted to wear red, white, and blue. Looks nice. Um, Roy chose to wear black. Great. Does it matter for salvation what color they're wearing? Not at all. You know, it's free. you have that freedom. That's something that we can control. Um, but when it comes to salvation, can you make God love you? No. He just does. And that's on God, because that, if you will, it's above our pay grade. You know, there are things we can, we can manage. Yeah. But even in the things that we manage... That's not earning us salvation. 
We're given the freedom to do those things, but it doesn't affect salvation. That makes sense? Um, one thing I just wanted to mention that just popped into my head is that often I think what happens is that we have wanted to, like a goal to work towards. Give us like it's like it's human nature to have a goal because we often lose motivation when we don't have a goal. So putting like a goal to our faith is like how many people like keep up with it, but they don't realize that now they're twisting the idea, making a human twist on glory, which is like how we went over in one of the sessions about how we're removing the human back factor out of the cross. Yes. Yes. So, what happens if we wake up in the morning um, acknowledging who we are before God? You know, in Luther's words, remembering, I'm baptized. I've been claimed by God, not of my own doing, but of God's doing. God has claimed me. God loves me. And then ask the question, wow, so I'm loved by God. What's God want me to be about today? Where's God going? What's God's mission today? And then look at life as going, oh, well, my neighbor's in need, or, or I can make a difference in the world by this. You're not going to earn anything by it, but it's rather the response to loved by God, what am I going to do with my life today? And we're given that freedom. Yeah. Does it earn us anything? No. But it fulfills us at the same time because we're living in that grace that how's that work for you Roy okay <laughs> no 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 this is good okay discuss we can't stand the idea of someone above us is grace too much for us that's in the second paragraph on page 52 in the text. The problem is, is that we can't stand the idea of someone actually above us. We can't accept an electing God. We will, we will not will it. Thus, regarding that which is truly above us, the will is not free but bound. Not forced, no one forces us to say no, we are just bound to do it. Okay, so think about work experiences. In work experiences, you have a boss. And the boss tells you what to do or not do, right? They, they, they give you freedom to do your job, but they're the one in control. How many times have we experienced where that may be the case, but by golly, there's somebody who doesn't like having a boss, and they know better. That ever experienced that? Have you ever done that? Well, <laughs> we all may have done that. That's what we're talking about. God is God, and we are not. And that idea of having someone above us we don't like that because we want to be God. Goes back to our sense of original sin. You know, we'll be like God. And that's what's getting at here. That bugs us. We don't like having someone above us. Therefore, is grace too much? Is grace too much for us to handle? Grace is given not because we deserve it. Because God just chooses to love us. Yeah. Grace is utterly free. Because God wants us to have that. God wants that relationship with us. I kind of have a problem with this. Okay. I feel like I accept our being above me. I do. Of course, I have relapses, and I just feel like I do. So I have a problem with that issue. Okay. Is it, is it that, is it individual or corporate? And what I mean by that is, 
Um, this is talking about the generalities of this is what humans struggle with, you know, that even, even, um, even though we desire it, you know, that at some level it still comes down to our desire is still not enough, you know. It's kind of like being in the work job I, that I had. I was raised, you did everything the right way. Yep. And going to work, I was called in and said, it's not black, it's not white, there's a gray one. And that was hard for me to accept, and that's what I'm talking about. Like, yeah. And it's hard, because I feel like I accept God being above me. And that's where, so, you, I think you raise a really good question. So we Lutherans have been around for over 500 years. So what does that mean? So we get to the point, we get it that the grace of God, what does that mean? Why, well, why are we still around? Um, what, what is going on? And the, for Luther, the issue would be, it's a continuum that we, we still in small ways still struggle with this, small and large ways still struggle with this. It's the constant recognition that it's all of God's doing and not ours. And Lutherans live happy lives trusting God. And that's what you've described. You get it, that God is above me and I'm but to respond to God. Yeah. And I know I sin every day because there's things I shouldn't say and get upset with people and try to control people. I know that. Yep. So, but it's just a little bit hard to accept. Yeah, and this is... It kind of makes me feel bad, like I'm a bad person sometimes, the reading of this. Okay. And Luther, Luther one of the struggles that Luther had was um, he, he experienced that there was, he could not find peace with God. It may, you know, he always felt guilty, yeah. And, and that, that sense of guilt. And Luther's explanation as he, in his theology is there, there's appropriate guilt, but God doesn't want us to feel guilty in that way. We're, we are freed by grace. We are set free by God's love. You know, and as in the center of that is just trusting Jesus and Jesus' word, trusting what Jesus has done for us. Um, and that's it. And then live our life as a life of response. Part of what we're reading here is the struggle that Luther had in a world that didn't think that way. And in our world today, the majority of folks don't think this way. I, yeah. I, I, yeah. Yes. I get that. Yeah. <laughs> so that it's, it's but. That's a lot. I mean, yeah. But, yeah, I get it. <laughs> yeah, so you shouldn't be feeling bad, but it's also, it's kind of affirming, it, it whole, I think what I'm hearing is that it's affirming what you actually believe, what you actually trust. So you shouldn't feel bad. Okay, and then I stop, because I take everything literally too. Yep. Big time. And I've been told don't do that. And this pushes some. This pushes some. It's dealing, gets into a little of that gray. The Luther, um, when, he, when he figures out all that, he makes it black and white. It's either this or this. And it's either Jesus and Jesus alone, grace alone, or it's not. And he holds it's grace alone. And it's in me that I'm the one who has to decide in my brain, it's okay what I'm doing. Except, yep. yep. Right. Yep. Because that's also the place where the devil pushes on us. The devil, you know, and in, in, in the 20, 20th century, um, Christians frequently didn't talk about the devil, and there were all kinds of jokes and, you know, d you know debunking. But the church still uses. You know, Brandy mentioned them in the sermon Sunday, the three renunciations, yeah, including against the devil. 
well, evil, devil, whatever you want to call this, still pushes on us. You know? In the garden, as it's described, you know, Adam and Eve were there. And, well, it wasn't just them. There was that other presence, Satan, you know, that, that then becomes the, the snake. Um, we are still pushed upon to make us think that we have to do something to, or, and attempt us to do things other than love. We still contend with this, but we don't contend alone. God is with us. Right. It's kind of a work ethic. Yeah. Know, you know, in a, in a way. You know, you work to get something, a reward. And we try to make that with God, but we don't get a reward. It's given freely. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like, oh, this is a real, it's not a, it's, it's not a good analogy, but it is an analogy that might be helpful. Um, what would happen if your employer gave you your lifetime salary that you would receive when they hired you? I, I don't mean like we promise this, but rather, here it is, it's yours. So think about the money that you made in your career. Add all of that up. That's going to be a lot of money. I don't, yeah. I don't know that we would be motivated. And maybe, and, and that's, and that's what, watch your foot, Carla. Yeah. Um, the, um, and that's why other theologies in the church came up. They come around the idea of control. They come around the idea of you've got to do something, you've got to earn it. What's going to motivate them, the people, to do what's right? And so that's the, that's the challenge that these other theologies bring. Luther's saying, no, day one, here you go live a life of response. So we really received that at baptism. Yes, ma'am. When we became children of God. Yes, ma'am. Totally given. Eternal already. There should not be a question, will I go to heaven? The answer is, Jesus has said so. I trust Jesus. I think the concept that me and like many other people struggle is that we expect it like in a world where like most things is transactional, where nearly everything's transactional, you try to add it to you know uh, God's love. Because often whenever we see something you know that's like too good to be true, we just we question its legitimacy and yes. think about how it's a scam or something. For this one, we know it's true. It's like deep down we know it's actually like pure, and we're. He's not asking for compensation or anything here. We just justify it, like receiving something. I think your word on it being a transactional world hits it well. Yeah. And we're caught with that. You don't get anything for free. I, yeah. I don't trust you on that. But with God, you do. Yeah. With God, it's given. I'll keep us going. Let's look at number six. Luther's theses attacks the theology of glory and the idea of doing your best as a means to influence God. Luther grasps that we are fallen, unable to lift ourselves up. What is Luther getting at with his understanding? What is he getting at? We are not free, but we are rather bound. Yeah. That we want to take and think that we're free, but we're not. It goes back to the idea that we are unable to help ourselves because we can just imagine like if we're in like a pit. There's no, no ladder, no rope, no nothing. 
we can't get ourselves out, no matter how much we crawl, kick, and try. But like, we can think of God as like someone with a rope or ladder here. He's dropping it down. Without him, it's impossible. Right. We can act like we have some input in this, but it was really all up to God. Yep. Yep. We, I think that's a good analogy, um, good metaphor for us, that we can, we can do all we want, yet it comes down to it was up to God, not us. Yeah. So this is why Luther ended up in a lot of trouble because these ideas shredded the ideas in the church at that time. Remember, this is the time that indulgences were being sold. You know, pay this amount of money and get your great aunt out of purgatory where she's being purged of the bad things. Um, or, you know, walk, you know, crawl your way up these steps praying and you'll earn. It was a means of controlling people. It was controlling the masses of people and generating income, income then that was being used for lavish lifestyles. And also, in particular, this was around the time of the building of St. Peter's um, Basilica in, in Rome. Um, which is a beautiful architectural place. It is. However, the money was raised on the backs of the people by selling salvation, which the church can't do. The church does not have the right to do. It is not ours. So that's why these things butted heads and why Luther was a threat to the church in his day, because he was proclaiming the system is wrong. And here's how God set it up. God set it up that it's grace and grace alone, yeah. which is liberating. Yeah. And when, imagine a world, instead of looking at controlling, is rather everyone is liberated to be part of God's mission in the world. Think how exciting that is when people have been set free by lo the love of God to go and love others. Well, that's transformative. That's what the church is called to be. That's what we are to be. Okay, getting back on to our questions. Number seven, according to Theses 14, what is the capacity of our will? Thesis 14 reads, free will after the fall has power to do, good, to do good only in a passive capacity, but it can always do evil in an active capacity. So according to this, what is the capacity of our will? That the will can do good. The will can do good, yep. We, we do have the capacity to do good, not for the sense of earning anything, but we can do good. Can we also do evil? Yeah. We can, yeah. We're human. We're still human. Humans are not God and can't be like God. Okay. In its passive capacity, the will can do good when it is acted upon from without, but not on its own, not in an active capacity. A commonly used physical analogy is water. Water has a passive capacity to be heated, but it can't heat itself. It has no active capacity to do that. Okay. On the one hand, you know, he lists corpses could be said to have a passive capacity for life because they can be raised from the dead. Jesus raised people from the dead. But not, of course, on their own power, not in an active capacity, not even in the slightest. And what this is getting at is the will to love God, the will to influence God is what he's countering. And he says the will can, you know, we have passive capability, not active. Make sense? 
The will to influence God. Yeah, the, to think that our, by our will that we can influence God. We can't. No. Yeah, we can't. And that's what he's getting at. Okay. Yeah, that's what he's getting at. Thesis 15 places salvation's dependence where, and here is Thesis 15, nor could free will remain in a state of innocence, much less do good in an active capacity, but only in its passive capacity. So at the top of um, page 57, you'll see that is to say, even before the fall, Adam and Eve were upheld in the state of innocence, not by their own power, but from without. Well, what was the source of that, their existence? God. God. It was God who held them in innocence. God who held them in that life. They remained strictly creatures who lived by faith and trusted in their creator and not their own power. Yeah. And that's what it's getting at. So where does salvation, where does it fall? Where does it place, the, where, on what are we dependent for our salvation? God, and only God. Number nine, according to theology of the cross, what is the fall? And I think this is an important piece um, for us, for us to grasp, um, because sometimes sin is dealt with um, as a particular sin versus original sin, and this is what this is getting at. So what is, looking at this, number nine, according to Theology of the Cross, what is the fall? Um, I saw it kind of described in two ways. It's when one is that when we put ourselves before God. Mm -hmm. And the other one is also mentioned, which I think is just a variant of it, is whenever we try to call something bad and good. Which I think goes back to the first one about how we believe that, oh, you say it's bad, but I think it's good. Thinking of like adding our twist to it, putting ourselves before God. Yes. Excellent, excellent. And that's what it's getting at. That, that attempt... To, to be above our pay grade, that attempt to do, God's, to, to do God's work, God's stuff, when it's really God's to do. Yeah. That's what the, the fall was, the temptation, you'll become like God. Yeah. You'll become like God. You, that is so key for us, to see then how we live that out in other ways in our lives. Let's keep going. Number 10. Discuss Forty's thoughts in paragraph 2 on page 58. Before the fall, the creature lives by faith, trusting that creation is good and bending all effort toward taking care of it. The creature has only a passive capacity for the good, not an active one. That is, the creature is never meant to stand or operate alone, but to be one through whom the Creator works. The creature is turned about to take care of the creation, to seek the good of the other, not for the self. To fall is precisely to be captivated, bound, seduced, and blinded by another vision, another hope, that of the active capacity of free will and its works. So what are you thinking about this? I say this is like how just give me like an example of how we view the world. Because like you mentioned like even our response about being saved should be we share love and every, share share love with everyone. However, this one's showing that we seek a different type of like goal. Like even though we have been saved, we're seeking something bigger or something more grandiose. Yeah. Seeking something that's not like very earthly, I guess you could say, because like, you know, getting very rich or being very right. famous. Because now you're no longer putting God first. You're trying to just 
find something bigger than you are. And we see this played out constantly through human history. The haves, the have-nots. Who's in power, who's not in power. Um, and so often we subjugate other people. We put other people under us to get ahead. I, I love Forty's description of before the fall because his, his way of showing us that, you know, the creature was a creation of God. They lived by trust. They lived by utter love of God. Um, and yet, there's a beautiful part. The creature was never meant to stand or operate alone, but to be one through whom the Creator works. What's being talked about here is union with God. The intimacy of the relationship between God and the creation. Yeah. When, when the fall does happen, um, what is the description given? That uh, at the time of the evening breeze, God showed up. God had intimate relationship with the creation. That was broken when the temptation was taken. Yeah. That was broke. That union with God was broken when it was, you'll become like God. Oh, I can deem what's good and not good. And we started having other hopes, other desires versus God. Okay. So this is, this is all key stuff that helps us look at, you know, our position of what has happened, who we are, and then what has God done about that? And that's where we're going with theology of the cross. Let's look at number 11. Thesis 16 is not a negative statement upon humanity, but rather a simple truth of the human condition. This thesis makes the theology of glory uncomfortable, but not the theology of the cross. Why? Here's the thesis. The person who believes that he can obtain grace by doing what is in him adds sin to sin so that he becomes doubly guilty. So, more in a modern way to say this, this is more like by putting ourselves in the position of God, we're actually making ourselves even worse, per se. Because the whole point is to show that, is to show that we are hopeless. Yes. But now we're saying, hey, I got this. Yep. No matter, like earlier, right? no matter how much we hit climb or whatever, we're not going to make it out ourselves. But we can, we can keep lying to ourselves, but it's actually, I feel like it's straying us from accepting it. Because we're no longer accepting his God, or God and his love fully. We're now pushing ourselves farther away, saying, I can do this. I, I can do it alone. We're not alone, but I can do it. And you just cover the rest. So on the... We, we're already under the, the, the difficulty of original sin, and then we're adding sin to sin by keeping going in that way and saying, I can do this. Exactly. Exactly. I think yeah. it's a human factor too as well. Yep. Which won't work. And doesn't work. And it's not what God designed. So for the theology of glory, it makes us very uncomfortable. But for the theology of the cross... We're okay with that because it's all about what God has done in Jesus for us and not about what we've done. It's about what God has done for us. And um, there's an interesting conversation between Lutherans and Orthodox Christians around the idea of union with Christ, and which is going back to the last piece is falls into this, that part of what God desires is union with us. Yeah. In giving us grace, in God's love for us, God frees us to be in intimate relationship with God. Yeah. Good. We'll keep going. Number 12. How does one obtain grace? By humility. 
by recognizing I, this, I can't do anything about it. You know, you know we're, the, the form of confession that we're using um, for worship this summer is the, an old one that we're, um, that we're using for a season. You know, we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. That's a statement of humility. I'm captive to sin and I cannot free myself. Yeah, I can't do it. I'm dependent upon God. And God has done that in Jesus Christ for us. That's humility. Okay. Number 13 then. But isn't humbling oneself doing something? So we've got a couple comments here. Isn't humbling oneself doing something? Doesn't Luther's exhortation to fall down and pray for grace and place your hope in Christ uh, mean we are doing what is in us? And Ferdy, of course, is saying, no, that's not where we're going. First, it must be remembered that the mention of humility here comes at the end of the long debate in which Luther has systematically charged that every possible kind of work done by the self, whether pious or impious, is deadly sin. He could hardly be proposing now that there was some kind of work, even humility, that escaped this judgment. And he continues, uh, next page, in the theology of the cross, however, the point is that the language is to be used in such a way that every prescription is cut off. This is the significance of Luther's resort um, here to the way language works. The law humbles, grace exalts. Thump something is done to us. And that's powerful, to recognize something is done to us. So what do we bring to Holy Communion? What do we bring to that sacrament? Nothing. Nothing. We receive. God invites us. You know, Jesus' invitation, invitation is to us to come eat and drink with the proclamation, this is my body given for you. Not because you're good enough, not because you think you want it, because God wants you to have it. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. That's why Luther's emphasis in his understanding of the sacrament um, emphasizes the words for you. That God is proclaiming this. We do nothing to receive it. God freely gives this. That's what grace is. The law humbles. The law meaning we see, you know, the law is a mirror before us that shows us how we have not lived up to who God wants us to be, how we have failed. Grace exalts. Grace is given freely and frees us to be who God created us to be. That's what he's... It seems like we do have to do something in order to get that. For instance, we have to behave as God would want us to treat our neighbor, to follow the commandments. Yes. Does that make you worthy to receive the sacrament? No. Uh, we get that automatically because we were baptized. Okay. Because we became children. But then he expects us, does he not, to live in a manner that he teaches us, such as, as I said before, loving your neighbor, doing things and not doing it so that you get recognition, but doing it because God says that that's the way we should live. Okay, and is that, does... Then are you worthy for communion? Then would you be worthy of communion? Mm -hmm. Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. 
I think I I think you're I think you're saying two things. I think you've got two things in there. One is you're getting it. It's about grace. It's freely given. But then what do we do with that? Yeah. And the, what we do with that is God's desire is for us, freed by grace, to live that grace into the world. We're going to fail. We are sinful by nature and unclean. So we know that, that, that we, will, we will do our best not to get something, not to earn anything. We will do our best to love because God has loved us. That's different than us doing something to receive it. Yes. So I, th- yes. I think you're on the same page. I think so too. Yeah. And it, so communion, why is it important that we receive communion as often as it is given? Because we have failed. And it is a reassurance to us. It is a constant reassurance of God's grace for our lives. Yeah. It's like a renewal. Yeah. And Luther did not stop the practice of every Sunday communion. He took away the regulations of, you know, God's going to get you if you don't come to church today. That's, you know, that, those ideas of you know, earning your merits, you know. He got rid of all that, but he never stopped that the church still observes every week communion because we hunger and thirst for God's grace. We need God's grace, and this is a gift of grace given to us. So does that mean that it's helping us to continue to do God's work? Yes, yes. And so it's re- Because the world will let you know how you failed. Yeah. The world's going to make sure you know that, you know, but this constant, it's like, okay, um, how many of us like going two or three days without eating? And what happens when we do that? Oh, we get cranky, <laughs> we, we get cranky, but, but it's going to throw our blood, our blood sugars off, it's going it, to, we're going to have all kinds of stuff, we'll, our body will start working on itself to absorb some of the fat and the muscle and all that kind of stuff, it's not healthy, we need nutrition, we need food to survive, same thing, this is spiritual food given to nourish us, to keep us in the journey to keep us going. Yeah. Right. Is it a cause and effect? God gives us grace. And so the effect is that we behave as he wants us to. Not to earn something, but because um, that, that's what he expects. He wants us. Yes. Um. Cause and effect with imperfect people. With what? Imperfect people. That, that indeed, because what God, the, the intent of God is that restoration of creation. All of creation has been reconciled back to God in Christ Jesus. You know, and with that idea, then it's that restoration to relationship prior to the fall. So it's, it's restoring us to right relationship with God. And what was the intent of, of the creatures that, that God loved to steward the earth, to care for the garden, to live in harmony and peace and love. So yes, cause and effect, this is where it leads, but with imperfect people who are still captive to sin. And, and then when we have that relationship, we feel the peace. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's not all just up here in the head. It's not all knowledge. It's, it's peace in our soul, in our being. Um, that's the spirituality part of us. And, and when we have done something nice or good, and we do feel the peace, then we have acted appropriately according to the theology of the cross. Yes. Yeah. Not not to be recognized for it, but 
to do it. In as our way of life. Yeah. As our way of life. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think that uh, you got it. Um, I just want to mention quickly that this, I'm talking about all this kind of reminded me about like about how there's multiple examples about how when we look at this, the Bible, there's also stories about us having no like relation to what's happening. It's all God's word. Like it reminded me of the time, I don't remember the details specifically, but one time a person was baptized with mud water. Mm. It's not us doing the work, it's not us doing any of the magic there. God is baptizing him. Yes. He is the one being um, saved. Yes. Because that is God saving him. Because, I mean, sure, we can change the water and all that. that that's not, the water is not the factor here. It is the God saving us. Yes. So that's what, I think that's what the story will show me points. It's not, it has nothing to do with us or whatever. We change the scenario or the landscape or whatever. <clears throat> it all comes down to God. Yes. And what's powerful, that's the story of the eunuch where Philip is... Um, called by the Spirit to, to encounter this man. Um, this eunuch is on his way back to Africa, um, having been in Jerusalem. He was a eunuch, so he could not enter into the fullness of the temple. He was only allowed so far because he, his body had been marred. His body was imperfect. So eunuchs could not enter into where the men were. They could only go so far. Um, into the temple to, to be present at worship. So this guy who has journeyed this pilgrimage to Jerusalem, this long journey, um, who only went in as far as he was allowed to go in, now is being encountered by God through Philip, God working through Philip as he opens the scriptures to this man. The guy was reading, I think it was Isaiah, um, and he, he opens up the scriptures and proclaims Christ and what's to prevent me from being baptized and there's water in the ditch and he baptizes him. And then Philip's gone. He's whisked away. And the Ethiopian um, church holds its roots back to that eunuch who came back proclaiming Christ. It was all about what God was doing. Yeah. Whereas at the temple, this man who was marred, who, whose body was not fully intact, was prohibited from the fullness of the temple. The temple being where God dwells, the intersection of God on earth with humans. God encounters him in the water in a ditch. That's grace. Yeah. God's, not, God's not limited to our boxes. Yeah. So the landscape can change. The water can change. Um, it could be the Gulf of Mexico. It could be the Mississippi River. It could be tap water from the Galveston water system. Yeah. It's what God's doing to save him, to save us. Let's keep going. Number 14. Now, I also realize in the copying, um, the numbers didn't make it onto the page. They're in the book, but they didn't quite make it onto the copied page. So this is at the top of page 63. Put the final portion of paragraph one on page 63 into your own words. Here's the final part. When you humble yourself and plead for grace, are you making the claim that you are doing something? If so, you're not pleading for grace, but only your own cause. And so you are still lost. Give up and believe the gospel. So try to put that into your own words. I'll give an answer. Trust Jesus. Trust Jesus at what Jesus has done. Trust Jesus at Jesus' word. The reality is we can't do any of it. 
our best efforts still fail. Trust Jesus. That's what's being gotten at in that, in that part of the paragraph. You can do all you want, but underlying it, there's always going to be a motive. Pleading for grace, well, you're pleading for yourself. You know, there's always going to be a motive. The bottom line is, we just have to trust Jesus. You know, it's to fall into the hands of a God who is merciful. A God who loves us. We're going to keep going. Number 15, does Luther's theology of the cross leave us in despair? And also there's an analogy worth looking at on the next page. So in this section, this is related to Thesis 17. Uh, Thesis 17 says, Nor does speaking in the manner give cause for despair, but for arousing the desire to humble oneself and seek the grace of Christ. Luther insists that speaking as a theologian of the cross, telling it like it is, does not give cause for despair, but rather awakens the one thing that can help, the desire for humility to seek the grace of Christ. It is important to see that the theologian of the cross moves to take up the question of despair only after hope in the grace of Christ has been announced. So does that, is it meant to leave us in despair? No. We don't need to waller in our sin in that way. Remember, that's part of what Luther struggled with. He couldn't find peace with God. And then as he's reading the scriptures, I mean, he did everything the church told him to do. But when he was reading the scriptures is when it came, you know, it became dubiously clear it's God and God alone, and look what God has done in Jesus Christ. It's about grace. And then he saw peace with God because of what God has done in Christ for him. That's the gospel. Uh, the analogy he uses, to use again the analogy of addiction, when the optimistic encouragement to quit fails, it only increases despair and fosters hypocrisy. For the alcoholic, the humility to confess I am an alcoholic, is not a mark of despair, but of hope. It is false optimism that brings ultimate despair. There is an interesting passage in Luther's treatise, and you can read that. One does not give cause for despair if one warns sick people of the seriousness of their illness and urges them to see a doctor for a cure. Despair would rather come if one is falsely optimistic and tells them they don't need a physician while they steadily decline toward death. I like the analogy according to the alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic. Um, when you say that, you're proclaiming, this is, I know I'm in need. Yeah. And that's that humility that, that Luther's talking about. It doesn't leave us to despair. Acknowledging the problem frees us for what God can do, God, what God has done. Yeah. That's what he's getting at. That makes sense? Okay. Um, yes, Roy? No, I'm trying to gather my thoughts before I say something here. I think he's talking about how, like earlier I mentioned about how it says that, oh, we still have a little bit. Like mm -hmm. earlier he was talking about how someone, like one of them said, Someone like you mentioned the uh, writing that we, no matter how little, we still have the input in our saying That is them just in the coping, as you could say, with the fact that then they might, thinking they do, yeah. creating a falsehood that yes. they have their own. However, in this, in the same example, of like how a person in the, uh, the writing they admit that they're an alcoholic. If you admit that you're a homeless, you're actually going closer to God. Yes. Yes. I can't do it. You know, I'm hopeless. Yeah. That's falling into the arms of God's grace. I'm not going to try to prop myself up with saying I can. My little bit isn't going to do a thing. I can only depend upon God. Um, and that's David's, you know, when David says after he's been confronted, let me fall into the arms of God, into the hands of God who is merciful. 
now. That's what's being talked about. Yes. Okay. What does utter despair mean? Page 60. Well, first, let's read um, Theses 18, because this is in that section. It is certain that man must utterly despair of his own ability before he is prepared to receive the grace of Christ. What does utter despair mean? Okay, this is on page 66. What do you think utter despair means? Except that no matter what, there's nothing to do. Yeah. Because, or like utter despair, like, or it's like, I guess the fact the acceptance part of it. Because the earlier we're talking about how, like, oh, we still have an input in this, that's probably called to, like, hope in the wrong way. False hope. Because mm -hmm. you still have hope in, with despair, it's not, the hope's not going the right way. Yeah. When you go to utter despair, you completely understand and know your situation. While, you know, when you're not in complete utter despair, you just continuously lying to yourself. Yeah. Once you reach utter despair, you fully accept God's love because you fully understand your situation. Utter despair puts us in the position of utter trust in Christ. It's, it's falling into the hands of the merciful God. It's that total, we can't do it, there's nothing we can do on our own. It's all about what God has done. So, you've made it through four sessions. And we've got more to go. We've got session five. You've gotten the materials today for that. Um, if you need those materials and you're online, let us know. And Brandy will have the last session prepared for us for next week to hand out. So, you're in the deep end of the pool. Keep swimming. Don't be afraid. Yes, ma'am. Down at the bottom, <clears throat> it says uh, the theologian of the cross knows that we do the world no good by playing the role of pious or sentimental optimist. One must say what a thing is. One is given the courage to be honest. So, does that mean literally that if somebody is in the hospital and sick? Um, you do not say things superfluously, like, oh, it's going to be all right, or you're going to be okay, or you're going to come through this. You shouldn't say that. You should say something like, God is with you. God loves you. God will take care of this situation. Mm -hmm. That's the theology of the cross. Yeah, meeting people. Not to say those uh, superficial comments that we are guilty of saying to people to try to comfort them. Yep. It's a false comfort. It's um, worst case scenario, one of the worst case scenarios was a, um, there was a, a nurse aide that was in one of my parishes long, long, long time ago. Um, she has long since been in the church triumphant because um, she was very old when I met her. Um, and she used to work in the maternity ward. And when a baby would die, she would go in and say, oh, God just needed another angel. And she thought she was comforting them. She wasn't speaking the truth. You know, we don't, humans don't become angels. And babies die. And that hurts. Yeah, the, the place, you know, that's, that's offering a false hope. Speaking the truth is admitting the despair of the world and saying, you know, gosh, this is a really tough time for you. Um, you know, I know that God is with you. Let's pray. Let's carry this before God. Let's entreat God, you know, to be present and active um, and speak of the hope that we have in God, not some false hope. You, you've seen that joke where uh, Mary Todd Lincoln is asking Abraham Lincoln, does this dress make me look too fat? 
<laughs> and he doesn't answer. <laughs> wise man, wise man. But we need, we need to be careful with our words and to be honest with our words. Yeah. That's the key right there. That's yeah. the theology of the cross, to be honest. Yeah, and meeting people in their brokenness and us facing our own brokenness. Yeah. I guess another thought that was running through my mind was a, a philanthropist who gives money mm -hmm. and gets recognition for it. I guess God has to look into each individual heart to see what the uh, motivation was for giving the money if it was to get the recognition, which would be theology of, the, of glory, or if it was a sincerity. I think when J.J. Uh, Watts helped Houston, I think that was a theology of the cross for which he acted. It was a sincere thing. I think Mathers Mack as he has helped the community is sincere. However, he has gotten a lot of recognition for his spelling that from work. Yeah, I think it's good to know God is the one to judge and not us. Yes. It's not left to us. We can only we can only be concerned about our own yeah. own motivations of the heart. Yeah. yeah. Yes, Ralph. I think it brings me back to it. It's our own consciousness that we need to work on. And the only thing we can find is in the Bible and what Jesus did and whatever. And we need to feel responsible for uh, doing this. And there are interesting stories. Uh, the world we are living in right now, we do all kinds of odd things. People drive like hey, crazy in their cars. So many people get killed every day. And you cannot get someone to just have to stop by the red light. They just drive right through it. And the police gets completely uh, attacked for stopping somebody. Don't do this and whatever. They attack the police. What is, but it has to do with the individual consciousness. No, I'm responsible to buy uh, responsible. You know. We're we're responsible to behave responsibly. That's right. Yeah. We can only control our own behavior. We can't control the behavior of others. And yeah. I think the church is, is really great in teaching us what what you are responsible for. It's a lot of stuff, a lot of good stuff. Well, we're wrapping up our session. Thank you for joining us. Again, like us on Facebook, follow us on YouTube. Let's have a closing prayer. The Lord be with you. Lord, you've been going with us into that deep end of the pool, but this end of the pool is where you're telling us and teaching us that you love us, and it's not about what we do, but about what you have done continue to open our hearts and minds to the grace that you have for us and help us to live that and share that in our lives. Watch over us now as we depart. Go with us into this next week. Help us in every way and let us but honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank y'all. <laughs>